another edition of the Australian Association, Association of Street Photographers Speaker Series for 2021. I'm Russell Mason, Vice President of ASPE and your host for tonight. Uh, as per usual, we'll do a bit of housekeeping and I'd like to ask everyone to keep their devices set to mute during tonight's presentation. Um, and if you'd like to ask any questions, do you have any questions, please type them into the chat function on your Google Meet screen. Now, I know this is the first time you've used that, so that would be the icon down the bottom of the screen that looks like a little uh, speech bubble. If you hover over that, I think it's, it's, it says um, message to all or something like that. But that's where you add, add your questions in there. And um, our moderator for tonight, Adrian, will pose your questions uh, to Sam as we go along. So uh, speaking of Sam, we have him as tonight's guest speaker. We're really excited to have a Sydney-based photographer, Sam Ferris. Uh, Sam's been shooting on the streets of Sydney for over a decade and has been involved with many exhibitions, publications um, over that time. He's a driving force behind Aussie Street and the Aussie Street Festival and is a member of Burn My Eye Collective. He's also a winner of multiple prizes and has also, also found enough time to produce a few publications of his own to boot. How does he do that? Yeah, um, Team Massive is excited to have Sam present tonight. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Sam. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Russell, for having me. Thanks, Aspie. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, joining you live from lockdown in Sydney. So <laughs> I think it's our turn now for a bit of lockdown. I think you guys had your fair share earlier. So um, it's given me some time to edit photos and look over the work I've done over the last few years and um, start to organise it a bit better. So it has been a productive time. Um, I was going to talk tonight just through sort of some work that I've done, um, my Sydney body of work. I'm going to show a few photos. There's some photos in there that I haven't shown anyone before, so um, it's exciting to show you guys for the first time some of that work. Um, and also just talk about a bit how about how I got started in street photography and um, my journey and, and the way I progressed and... Um, how it's taken me sort of 10 years to sort of find my voice in street photography and understand what I want to do with this um, genre. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and maybe you guys can tell me if that's going to, if that's coming up for you or not. This is the presentation that I've put together for tonight. All right, so there should be a tile with my name there. Is that something yep. that you guys can see? All good, Sam. Looks cool. Good. So, yeah, there's my tile. Um, so, yeah, that's that's me, um, sort of bio there. Um, I think Russell went through most of that. So my street photography, um, I guess it started um, probably a little bit over 10 years ago. Um, I started... Uh, living in Sydney, um, I got a scholarship to relocate to Sydney um, to undertake a job at a university here. Um, I was doing a research um, degree and, and was doing some research for academics and that kind of thing and teaching a few courses. Um, and I really just was really lonely, isolated, didn't have anywhere um, kind of to be apart from the university, didn't have anyone to talk to. I was in one of those cubicle kind of situations where the guy I was sharing the cubicle with was um, about 70 years old and he was a hypnotherapist and he was writing his PhD on on being a hypnotherapist. So I'd have these amazing conversations with him, but that was sort of it as far as, as, far as social interaction. So while moving to Sydney sort of allowed me to get out of my comfort zone a little bit and um, get away from sort of the suburban Melbourne setting which one which I'd grown up in and which um, a lot of people remain in for their whole lives um, it was also something that challenged me quite a lot in terms of sort of being alone for the first time and not fitting in and being overwhelmed by the city and, and that kind of thing so um, that's where I was sort of 2008 2008 was when I moved to Sydney and um, I hadn't really picked up a camera before then with any sort of artistic intent or any intent of going on the street and shooting. Um, so I'll just show you this. Um, this is obviously a painting by, by Jeffrey Smart. 
Um, the reason why I've got this in here is the very first kind of slide of the presentation is because this was sort of my early reference point for street photography. This was the early influence um, on my work. Uh, why is that? Well, my, my father is, is an artist, so he's a painter, and I grew up in a house full of paintings, full of art books, and my father was actually a friend of Jeffrey Smart's, and they used to correspond and um, write letters to each other, and he was a bit of a mentor to my to my dad and his paint and helped him develop his work. So being a kid and being interested in, in what my dad was doing all the time in his studio, I'd obviously ask lots of questions about the paintings and... Um, He'd tell me about them and he'd, and it would be one of our best sort of best times and best memories together where he'd explain his artwork and his paintings and how they worked and how he put them together and how he used vanishing points and lines and colour theory and all these um, amazing sort of artistic and painterly techniques to, to put together the work that he'd kind of um, learned from from Jeffrey Smart and, and looking at his, his work. Um, so that influenced the type of photos that I sort of took early on. Um, I, I looked for those architectural backgrounds and um, settings. This was actually in Melbourne. I think I might have taken this just before moving to Sydney at, one, at some point. And, of course, this is it had to be in black and white because I thought, well, if you're going to do something with artistic intent, it has to be a black and white photo. So <laughs> there's, there's, there's sort of my very first street photo or one of them. Um, I went overseas to, to Paris and took the camera with me there as well. Um, I got a bit of a, a, a grant to go and do some research in Paris about the Australian war effort in, in the First World War and look at their archives and that kind of thing. So we went to, went to Paris and um, I just took the camera with me everywhere and obviously photographed that city um, to death because, because I'd never sort of been to Europe before and seen... Um, how different it was to what I what I was used to back home. And I started to first of all photograph the monuments and the famous places and everything that a tourist usually does. But then I sort of the longer I was there, I think we were about I think we were there for about three months. Um, the longer I was there, I started to more turn the camera on daily life. And this was the street that we lived in um, on in uh, I think the suburb of Goncourt. And it was just a snowy kind of wintry day and guy crossing the street and, and managed to frame him that way. And I thought, oh, wow, that's something. Um, obviously, like the cliche shots, I went for those as well, the, the black and white shot, um, the Parisian gentleman walking across the bridge, um, sort of the quintessential Paris scene. Um, back in Sydney, I was working at, uni still and, and still had the camera with me and um, studying again because I figured out that the academic life wasn't for me and that I was more interested in pursuing um, a teaching career. So I enrolled in the University of Sydney's um, Master of Teaching course and uh, this, this shot was taken just while I was on the way to the Fisher Library there. Um, one day I sort of waited around and thought that architecture is really nice and there's a leading line there. I just have to wait for someone to come through the frame. And when I when I took this one, I was quite proud of it at the time. Um, the more I researched street photography and the more I looked at photos online and looked at photojournalism and, and the great works of street photography, I realised that I was too far away from the subject matter. There's that quote from Robert Kappa, which I'm sure... A lot of people know which is um, about being close and if your photos aren't good enough then you're not close enough and um, at the time I thought that meant physical distance but over sort of the years I've come to learn that that just doesn't only refer to physical distance but it's also emotional distance and um, maybe the intellectual distance between you and the subject as well so creating something that you're connected to in more than just a physical sense but maybe an emotional or intellectual sense as well um, but nevertheless early on I tried to get closer and here's one sort of cliche kind of juxtaposition between a, a sign and a lady waiting for a train um, I started to get into color at the time because I'd seen a Joel Meyerwitz exhibition and, and had read a lot of, about his work and he sort of talked about how the world was in colour and 
that's what we see so why not photograph it that way and i started using color and kind of fell in love with color because i think there was that connection to my my dad's paintings which are very bright and vibrant and the jeffrey smart works as well um so this was an early color photograph um again sort of using a long lens and an early kind of color shot in sydney this was when the monorail was still in sydney so i remember standing there and it was going overhead while i was taking this um in newtown in sydney so again sort of a long lens it's compressing the distance between the the side of the street that i'm on i'm on and the, the other side of the street there um and i started thinking more about photos in terms of their layers at this point um trying to have a foreground and a background for example was something that i began learning about and, and thinking that that could make a more interesting composition um, again taking photos while i was at uni so it's a I think a open day tent there and someone having a look inside um, I'd go to I'd go places where I knew there'd be people with cameras because starting out and um, doing street photography, I was very nervous and apprehensive about going out into public places and, and taking photos of strangers, essentially. Um, so I'd, I'd try and go places where I knew that I'd feel more comfortable. And one of those sort of places was the Sculptures by the Sea exhibition that happened every year. Um, other events or oh, that's that's on the way to the sculptures by the sea just sort of walking past the scene there um there's another one sculptures by the sea so i go back to that again and again because there was lots of people with cameras and that i thought the sculptures were were interesting things to use in a photograph um there was a big arts installation in hyde park in sydney so art and about is a festival that's on every year and that one had these mirrored columns and i tried to use those in a photo um, again, being at uni and just shooting during the breaks between lectures. Um, as part of the teaching degree I was on, we had practical placements, so we'd get sent all over Sydney and, and um, it was really good because I hadn't been to many places in Sydney before. I sort of knew the city and I knew Newtown where I lived and I knew the university campuses, but um, this was out in Liverpool. Um, I was teaching for a little while at a school called Miller Technology High School, which was in a sort of low socioeconomic area of um, Sydney out west. Um, and this was sort of the view through the bus window one day. I thought the the scarf and the and the the sunshade on the on the truck kind of matched. There was a bit of a silhouette in the foreground as well. Um, another time I did a placement at a school near Randwick Racecourse. So I'd walk past the race course and I'd take the camera with me and photograph the setting up of the races. Um, and the Opera House was a was a big one because um, that was the major tourist destination in Sydney and you could feel comfortable with a camera and you could take sort of photos and no one would sort of look at you differently. Um, so I tried to explore around there with the camera and, and use it as a way of learning how to compose a photo and, and get close and um, use space and use the camera effectively. Um, another place when I was on was it obviously my home suburb of Newtown. Um, so this was while I was walking to school one morning, just at the station, there was some really nice light and it's an early photograph. So all this work is probably around 2010 to 2012 ish. So that transition from color to Sorry, that transition from black and white to colour was a big moment for me where I realised that um, colour had a lot of potential in, in expressing emotion and um, creating layers and depth in the composition and also sort of that, that ability of the photograph to sort of show the extraordinary in the ordinary. Um, I was really into Joel Meyerwitz and Alex Webb and... Um, even the, the medium format work that Trent Park had done in Sydney as well, um, which was in colour. Um, my next stage of experimentation, so after I'd been through all that and moved from black and white to colour, I got a flash, and this was probably around 2012. Um, I really liked the work of not only sort of the 
photographers like Bruce Gilden, but also um, uh, Dirty Harry on on Flickr, so hardcore street photography on Flickr, and um, Shara Lampos, the Greek photographer, um, this amazing photographer who creates these surreal kind of scenes with a flash. I really got into his stuff and tried to kind of take some of that on board and experiment with that. So this was just on the floor of my apartment block at the time and the cockroach kind of mirrors the the sign there um i still go to events shooting flash became a new challenge so i go to things like mardi gras with the flash um hit the streets i think this was a, another trip to to paris maybe um this was in Berlin, a uh, tour guide kind of giving a tour and I saw the thing in the sky and I think he was pointing at some sort of monument so I decided to try and line the two up. Um, and this one here, this one I think was the end of um, the end of the sort of the experimentation phase that was around 2013. Um, I figured out the flash could kind of create these surreal effects and and I've been experimenting with them and then found a scene where the the swans and the white white color of the swans and the blown out tree kind of matched up together um so yeah that, that's sort of the introduction to where I started and and um how I got going in in street photography and the experimentation it took for before I even sort of knew what I was doing and and um how it took two or three or probably more, yeah, three solid years for um, me to experiment and, and sort of find out different ways of shooting street and um, how to make a, a street photo. Um, so, yeah, I'll just, yeah, talk you through sort of um, the work that I've been doing in Sydney, what it means, um, what I look for on the street. So this is my main sort of body of work that I brought to you guys tonight, which is um, uh, sort of encompasses all the minor projects that I've done. So um, those of you who might have followed my work, you might have seen that I've shot a lot around the ferry terminals and Circular Quay in Sydney. I've done a bit of work in Newtown that I've been to, been shooting events for many years as well. Um, all these projects sort of coalesced together in in the single sort of um, take on Sydney that um, really came from my first experience of being here and feeling out of place and feeling um, overwhelmed by a big city, um, an international city and, and something different from those sort of suburbs of Melbourne where I grew up. Um, so, yeah, this, this series is called Invisible, in, Invisible Light. Um, and I had to recently explain the title to, to someone as well and, and um, English wasn't their native language so they didn't understand the deliberate kind of deconstruction of the title where um, in and visible are, are two separate words but um, obviously light is the big conceit of the work. Um, any of you who have shot street photography in Sydney know that we do um, get this kind of amazing light that... Um, it's there all year round. We're very lucky. Um, but also, uh, if you shoot somewhere like the city, you get these reflections and reflected lights and this haunting kind of eerie green blue light that, that sort of juxtaposes that golden light of the afternoon. So um, the light is almost viscous. It's palpable. So it's in the visible light of Sydney these photographs are made, but it's also shining a light, I guess, on my emotional state and, and vulnerabilities at the time. So I've always started the series with this photograph here, which is sort of a lady looking lost and um, almost like she's on the lookout for something. Um, this was an early one, I think around 2013, just sort of a, um, a, a quirky kind of scene at around near Town Hall Station. The man was sort of transfixed with the apple in his mouth for quite a while, so went past once and took a few shots and then doubled back and went past again and, and found something to fill the rest of the frame, sort of two walks of life and then the bird in the middle. I always liked how that umbrella in the back background as well kind of matched that apple. Um, the Opera House, this was a really enjoyable day of shooting. I think um, the water broke at 
my school where I work and we had the afternoon off so I got to the opera house and took some photos of the birds flying around chasing the tourists um this was also an early one I guess this one I'm I've always been sort of in two minds about because it's a bit of a, a cliche um you see this shot a lot in street photography um initially i sat down because the the lady reading the book in the background had this really striking posture um and then the lady sort of directly in front of me started texting on her phone and and i think the harsh light and everything she couldn't see so she put the magazine up and um there was this face on the back and i was like wow i have to take that um this was the fleet review so it was a big event around 2013. Um, this one is on that corner of King and, and George Street that's very popular for, for street photographers. I saw this guy struggling along with $10 in his mouth. He was sort of getting his wallet and fixing his pants at the same time. So I raced over and got a shot, and I don't think he was too happy about it. This, this is a kind of recent one. Um, this happened earlier this year. Um, sort of this this spot with the shadow with the cross has become a bit of a hot spot for street photographers. Um, there was a fight between two people um, or three people, I think. Uh, I heard the fight going on and I said to my friend who was there shooting with me, I said, oh, I heard that. I'm going to go find out where it was. And I raced off to find it. But then the fight sort of ended up on the corner where where we were initially so i came back and um the police were called and they broke up the fight and took, were taking statements and everything but there was a lot of a lot of police around and and um, this amazing light and the symbolic cross there so it was just a, a really good scene to work um to work with um there's circular key again when they were redeveloping things there like the crane and, and the arms and the different layers there. It's almost like the shadows um, match the, the silhouettes in the background and then the two arms of the pointing um, construction workers match that angle of the crane a little bit. So that, that, that was a scene that I was drawn to there. Um, I tend to go for these multi-layered um, complex scenes. Um, it's a very high degree of difficulty to try and fill the frame and get everything to work. Um, but when you pull it off, it is it is quite a rewarding, rewarding thing. Um, this one's in Martin Place. Uh, people just waiting in the autumn light for the lights to change. Very peaceful, serene. Um, the printer that that I use is is it sort of the, this amazing amazing printer, but she's also very insightful with photographs and she always said to me that the people in your photos look very serene and almost like they're floating along and daydreaming. So I always thought that's a nice kind of way of um, verbalising something that I might be looking for on the street, but maybe it's unconscious. Um, this is another street on Martin Place. These two photos were actually taken about a year apart from one another. Um, I've actually printed them side by side. Um, before um, my friends Mike and Greg who are also street photographers in Sydney or well, Greg now lives in Ireland but um, Mike's still here we used to have print nights um, quite regularly and I think those guys saw that those two photos this one and this one um, on the table and, and all of a sudden put them together and it was like they were meant for each other so that's been printed as, as almost like a panorama um, for exhibitions and that kind of thing which is really cool um, that's that reflected light on King Street. I try and duck down low and angle up to get the light in the photo. And I like the little bit of reflection there. It's almost like a little flower on her face. It's Bridge Street and uh, of course you can see the bridge. I just liked... Um, the gesture across the road and the, the hand gripping the, the traffic pole in front of me and the hair being swept by the summer wind. This one, um, sort of the photo that I'm 
most well known for, I guess. Um, it's from 2014 and it's shot in the morning. So it's something different to a lot of my work. This one being a morning photograph where I was off to a tutoring appointment and I used to do tutoring of um, HSC students in order to get, get the money to survive while I was retraining as a teacher. And um, the appointment that morning had been cancelled and I was already on the train. So um, I stayed on the train and ended up at Circular Quay and there was this fog um, that was really interesting. But then it started to lift and the light came through and I saw this building with, where the light was hitting um, the building and reflecting off while the fog was still there and it created this kind of magic effect and I raced over and initially I tried to use it as a, as a background. I tried to have people walking past in the foreground and have this going on in the background but um, I was just luckily I decided to take a few frames just of the building before leaving and these birds swept through and I saw them sort of out of the corner of my eye and took a couple of shots and one of them you can see the birds sort of flying in and then the other one they're framed by that or they're they're on the line of that light so it's a really lucky lucky shot um, this one's earlier in the year uh, construction site down at Circular Quay. I think they were spraying lots of water. It was the light was hitting it, creating that mist. Um, it's King Street again. Pedestrians, colour, light, the foot traffic. It's almost cinematic that light sometimes. Um, that's North Sydney. The stripes matching the architecture there. It's down at Circular Quay, um, looking in through a window, reflections. Again, Circular Quay. Um, this one is a shot that is a more recent one and took a, a while to figure out. So it's um, inside the new Wynyard train station in Sydney. And I started off by shooting outside the station and then shooting through the window. And then... Um, there was a the, the station was still under construction so there was some extra glass lying around so um they'd left it there one day so i decided to shoot through the glass and i think it was about three layers of glass there so it gave this really layered um effect to the photo where the light's coming direct and then reflected and there's all sorts of things going on to create this complex image um, the same with this one here again like I think photos are often um, puzzles that you can kind of figure out over time you can find the location for a photograph but you might not necessarily have all the pieces coming together or you might look at your photographs um, and realize why they don't work and notice um, notice things in the in the frame that that are redeeming though that that might bring you back to the spot again to try and figure out how to do it better or a different angle and this was definitely one of those spots um a new building down at barangaroo in sydney uh, had this green colored glass initially I, I shot through sort of one of these elevators but then um after doing it for a few weeks i realized that you get this really interesting effect if you shot through two or three of the elevators at once and um, especially when the light was hitting it directly once again that layered kind of effect um, circular key again again through colored glass um, rain rain is something that i'm always excited about as well as light um, and if i ever have rain and light together it gets me really excited so <laughs> they're the best days um this was a december day uh, you can see the christmas decorations in the background um big storm came through uh, huge drops of rain really warm humid conditions um instantly saturated and flooded all the streets but um the light came out out soon after the storm it was passing so he still had the rain falling and the light coming out. It was kind of magical um, being sort of ankle deep in water, completely soaked in this warm water and uh, this stunning light um, coming through and, and being able to shoot 
in those conditions. I think I took maybe a thousand photos in about an hour. It was really um, intense. Uh, this is Martin Place in Sydney. So again, looking for reflections as well as reflected light as well as direct light. Um, it's another one, sort of trying to those three layers. I'd seen this photograph in my head for years with the cars driving past, the people waiting across the road on both sides. Um, this is sort of the best I've got after trying it for maybe two or three years. Again, reflected light. I like the pattern of the light on the ground there and a single solitary figure kind of looking bemused or confused. Smoke and vaping. Um, it's been a good kind of uh, trend for street photographers. Lots of good vape photos out there. This one's not, not amazing, but um, still shows that light. This is kind of a better one where there's a bit of a leading perspective sort of focusing on the on the person with the cloud puffing up it's like a mushroom cloud this one's fairly well known i guess this one was um in the moran prize a few years ago um just like how those colors on the dress match some of the other colors in the scene again the serene kind of peaceful face almost in her own world and the hair being swept up by the, the wind on this corner. Um, yeah, I mean, photographs happen anywhere, I guess. It's not just in the city. This one is close to where my kids go, went or had, had gone to childcare. Um, it was a bed shop. Statue in the window and the light was just hitting it. So I had to take some photos. And on the corner, these bags were a big trend for a while. I think people had T-shirts with that design on it too. So always, always went for those whenever I saw them. And I just liked this one, even though it's a bit of a mess, the the guy holding the can and the, the cigarette in his hand and his ties off and got a bit of a, a grin on his face, um, as well as that, that dog sort of looking quite angry. Um, as I said earlier, sort of, Anywhere there's going to be people and anywhere there's an expectation of photographers, I'd say if you are looking to work on your confidence as a street photographer, go check out events when when they happen again. Um, this is Newtown Festival. It's always a good one to shoot for street photographers. happens in November when the light's really good. Um, there was a band playing. They just sort of turned up on the street and all of a sudden 200 people are around there rocking out and... Um, the crowd were really into it, so I took some photos of the crowd. Uh, protests can be really good as well. This was from one of the Extinction Rebellion protests. I think this was a special Halloween one that they held a couple of years ago. Uh, everyone was in costumes. Um, see sort of Freddy Krueger in the background there and some alligators. And this, this girl with the sort of Day of the Dead face was really stunning and um, the light striking her and um sort of the stoic look on her face maybe want to sort of take that photo um this was one that i just happened to be in the right place for the right time there was an artist doing a, a kind of course or a residency at the opera house um and he invited children to come along and make these masks and then they did the the dragon parade um with the drummers and the dragon dancers and uh it was one of those amazing days at the opera house where thousands of people and um all this color and movement and birds swooping around and and i was just in the right place right time because i always would go there um at that time of year and was rewarded with this really frenetic interesting scene to shoot um the birds at the opera house a lot of the street photographers in sydney <laughs> enjoy shooting these birds they're real characters they're um very aggressive anyone who's been to the circular key and opera house area knows that they won't just um sit there begging for chips they'll actually try and knock them out of your hand and and um steal them that way and um catches a lot of the tourists off guard my friend bryce and my friend mike have some really good shots of the birds actually doing this um in the middle of sort of knocking food out of someone's hand and sort of jumping on them and 
scaring them. And, and uh, this this scene was one of those where the birds had sort of one got some food and were all had I think one of them had eaten it and they're all flying off. And I managed to sort of get there in time to take a shot. Um, again on the street corner again the sort of serene face. Um, this one this one I did for the a book that I put together. Um, last year, I did a little book called Fairy Tales. There's photos from the Manly Ferry. Um, and this one I'd just gotten off the ferry at Circular Quay and there's always a, a performer sort of doing this act where he juggles flaming, um, sort of juggles flaming things while he's up on up in the air on a bike. But I just liked the way the crowd was sort of being hit by the light there and took this shot. Um, that one's on the ferry, so the ferry is a really good spot to, to shoot everyone in commute. But again, it's that Sydney Sydney light that comes across the, the harbour and catches everyone at the end of the day. More seagulls. This one I was thinking of the Matt Stewart shot with the with the pigeon and the legs. One probably one of the most famous street photographs of all time and one of the best um, and original. Um, so this sort of pales in comparison to Matt's, but it's um, sort of an homage to him <laughs> in some way. The passengers getting off the ferry is something that I've been obsessed with for years. Um, I know what time the ferry docks. I know uh, when the light's going to be good at Circular Quay for the ferry docking. So I'd wait there for the passengers to get off and you'd have people from all walks of life all ages, all different backgrounds, multi, very multicultural because a lot of tourists are drawn to the, the ferries and the quay. Um, and you get this amazing scene of hundreds of people packed together in a very small public space. And um, it would remind me of sort of like an old master's painting, the faces and the limbs and um, the overlaps, sort of creating that three-dimensional feel. Um, that's two shots side by side, two different ferries embark, uh, disembarking, passengers disembarking from two different ferries. So I do this for years and then um, start pairing them together to create these almost panorama type prints. There's another one. Another one. I think that one must be winter time because everyone's rugged up. Um, more more shots of the ferry disembarking. This was something that I was really uh, thinking about doing as a long as, as a sort of a long term project. Um, more more shots at Circular Quay. It's an area that's gone under a lot of development lately. This one was in the Head On Festival last year, but unfortunately didn't go ahead. It's another layered shot with public transport. <laughs> More circular key. It's a French festival that's down at Circular Key. It was meant to be on um, a couple of weeks ago, obviously, but we uh, we, we uh, went into lockdown instead, so I didn't get to shoot the French festival this year. But it's always a, a good one. So Sam, I've got a question here from yep. um, Sally. She asks, um, "What lens do you shoot with these days, and do you still use a longer lens?" Um, yeah, so it's a, a Leica Q2, um, which is a fixed 28 millimeter lens. So it's not a long lens anymore. It's a very wide angled lens. Um, so I try to make sure um, that I'm using my feet to zoom rather than the lens itself. So those earlier shots in the presentation where I said it's a bit of a longer lens, um, they were shot with a 50 millimeter lens or a 50 millimeter equivalent. And that's why it compressed the space from one side of the road to the other quite severely. Um, and then I went down to a 35 millimeter for a while. Um, and then now I've ended up at a 28 millimeter. I think that's what I'll probably stay at because it's a really good focal length for street photography. Um, it just seems that um, there's enough space there to, to work a scene and, and um, use my feet rather than sort of having to rely on the lens to create the space. Excellent. Thanks, Sam. No, cool. I'll just put that presentation back up. That's all right. Sure, Mike. Yeah, no worries. Can you guys see that again? 
Yep, all good. Cool. Um, so yeah, this, I mean, this photo, for example, is is shot on a thirty five millimeter equivalent. So this was probably two thousand and seventeen. Um, and so I was on a 35 millimeter there and you can see that space is a little bit compressed that space between the background figures walking and the, the hand touching the pole um, it's still wide enough to fit a lot in the frame but that space is a little bit compressed so with a 28 millimeter that space we pushed back further that that guy walking in the background he'd be a lot smaller um, so it's a different look I mean there's no wrong answer for the type of lens that you should be using um, my friend uh, in Bern, Maya Gustavo, who's probably one of the best photographers that I know, he actually uses um, a zoom lens sometimes that, that goes between 18 millimeter and um, 35 millimeter. So he's he's um, using a variable focal length, and his his photos are like amazing. So um, yeah, there's no there's no right right or wrong answer for the lens. It's what it's the look that you want to capture and um, it's what feels right for you in terms of how close you want to get and how you want to approach a scene. And uh, Tony Redrop asks, um, do you, uh, are they all rangefinder cameras? Sorry, what was that? Um, Tony Redrop is asking, are they all rangefinder cameras? Um, I guess I've never really used a true rangefinder, like, um, like say like a Leica M6 or something like that. I've never been on any system like that before um these are all sort of the cameras that i've used have been uh fuji cameras and now like the Leica q2 um and they emulate a rangefinder a lot of ways so um the fuji has the optical viewfinder um which has a nice uh sort of electronic frame line on it that helps um you see things coming into the frame so it's a little bit range finder in that way but it doesn't have the actual range finder mechanism in it um, while the Leica Q2 has this focus peaking function where um, you can adjust the focus as you're shooting and you can see a red highlight around what's in focus so it's almost like the two images coming together in the range finder but um, an, an electronic equivalent so I've never really used the the traditional range finder in that sense but I guess the cameras I've used have been Sort of rangefinder esque in a long way. All right, excellent. Thanks. Sorry. I'll let you go on, Sam. Cool. All right. I'll just yeah. Put that presentation back. Yep. Cool. Um, this one again, circular key, sort of lady, winter time, no stopping. She's stopping for a coffee. It's a bit of a cliche, but I I like the photo something vulnerable and fragile about the way she's standing and relishing her coffee in the cold sort of winter day. Um, this one's a fairly recent one. You can see a masked person in the background. Um, we, we, this is a corner that a lot of my friends and I who shoot street in Sydney would often be at or, or gravitate towards because the light is just superb um, around this corner in certain times of the year. The mannequins in the window were, were something that I was interested in for a while. Um, just the way the light hit those mannequins was really stunning. So I tried to work that scene over a few weeks and this lady um, wearing a, a jacket with Frida Kahlo on it, um, walking past sort of completed that scene and then the, luckily the background elements, there wasn't any sort of major overlap or anything. So it's a, it's a photograph that maybe... Um, yeah, maybe that, that took a few weeks to, to sort of think about and put together and how to frame it and um, how to work that scene and create the, the layers and the perspective that I was happy with. Um, tried many different orientations and different ways of holding the camera. I think this one I was almost holding the camera above my head and taking it that way. Um, we just had trams in Sydney the last couple of years. The tram lines took years to put in, caused all the chaos and disruption around the city, but the trams are going now. So a lot of us are obsessed with shooting through the tram windows, uh, especially when the light's good. This one was a recent one. I think this was when the first um, sort of first wave of the pandemic sort of was kicking off and um, you can see the sign on the door about wearing a face mask sort of faintly there, a bit blown out. And this girl sort of against the door almost sort of doing a little prayer or something as she was travelling along holding that juice for dear life. Um, 
It's again circular key through the windows. Windows and reflection is something that I think that I shoot quite regularly to create that sort of mist, um, sort of magical, sort of surreal, uh, layered type image. Um, flowers, again, that's something that you might see a lot in my work. Um, I like the symbolism of, of flowers, especially um, bunches of flowers. They're, they're beautiful for a moment, but then they sort of are dying or withering away. Um, there's that sort of Ezra Pound uh, short poem, The Station in the Metro, about the petals on the wet black bough. And um, you realise it's quite a sad poem when you when you read it because these petals are beautiful and he's describing the people's faces in the crowd as these petals, but we know the petals have fallen off in a rainstorm and caught the wet black branches of the tree and, um, I mean, the petals, their beauty will soon be gone. It's, a, it's an ephemeral thing. So flowers is something that I think I've always been kind of drawn to in photographs and whenever I see a bunch of flowers coming, I'm always keen to try and get a photograph of it. Um, that's that's quite a recent one. It's a silhouette. Um, again, that, that's that King Street corner. I was busy at the time. I think the Louis Vuitton store was reopening. So you can see the, the fashion photographers there on the left-hand side queuing up. Um, lots of people hanging around, gravitating, and you could I could move in and out of the crowd pretty easily and take lots of photos that day. It's um, King Street again, sort of ducking down to try and create that layered frame. Same point again, it's a different angle and different time of year. So there's reflected light instead of direct light. You can see it really busy. The light's just catching a couple of faces and one person there. It's a, quite a recent one. I think that's a 20... 20 photo um these facades were put up around the city wherever they were building something and this guy came past on a skateboard and i quickly took a photo of him he looks like he's diving or falling a little bit reaching out for something maybe this is a very early one i think this might be like 2013 2013 around that time you can see that 50 millimeter lenses compress things between the background and the foreground. And this guy I saw walking along, spinning the ball on his finger, and I sort of chased him for a, a block um, and managed to get a photo where, where things kind of came together, luckily. Um, people in costume at the end of the year, the Vikings invading Sydney there. It's Luna Park, family out for the day. I think that I took this around that 2013, 2014 period where I was really into Alex Webb and um, really into trying to create layers and and, and um, create those really colourful layered scenes that I, that, that I admired in his work. It's Martin Place. Guys, maybe you can't quite see it, but he's on a, on a little skateboard, like a little penny skateboard. And he's also holding his surfboard, so I thought that was quite quite cool how he's sort of skating down Martin Place and he's got this fountain in the background that looks a bit like a wave and he's holding his surfboard. It's a fairly recent one, the red dress. There's that line of light sort of tank striking on the corner. This one's in Newtown, sort of nearby where I live and where I've lived for the last sort of 10 years or so. Um, you can see this was taken during sort of pandemic times, all the signage. Um, but also this was obviously a time where things were looking better because no one's masked up and um, I could get quite close and work that scene while people were waiting for the traffic lights and I managed to slip in front of this person with the hat and and get her in frame while the background came together as well. So, um, maybe 2015, all the road work in Sydney. It's an earlier one. Um, it's on Market Street. Again, flowers. 
something that might be there in a few photos. Um, this was a good day. My friend Mike and I were were hanging out and the light had gone really bad and um, another friend of ours went home early and we just hang out, hung out a little bit longer than we probably um, should have. We were just sort of um, very, very hopeful that the light would come good and um, it, it, it did. It was magic. It, the clouds parted. We had about 10 minutes of sun. The, the rain even started drizzling and there was some event going on at the state at the, at the theater nearby so um there was that was cordoned off there were police and i just managed to catch this lady's sort of mouth as she's walking through and the red of the red kind of match there but um it was one of those really good experiences where your faith is kind of rewarded your um you that staying out for the extra 10 minutes paid off when often it doesn't but that one time it does is always always really good and Sam, we've got another question here from Mark Adams. Yep. Do you shoot with projects in mind or do you prefer to shoot more freely and then identify themes in your work? Yeah, it's a really good one. Um, so initially I didn't have any sort of project in mind. I shot as much as I could because I knew I loved it. I knew it was good for me. Um, I probably wasn't in the best state of mind back then when I first started street photography and I was very down and lonely and and sort of struggling a little bit and um so i shot as much as i could and and um the more i shot the more patterns started to emerge in in the photos that i was making so it was almost like the photographs were a, a, a raw such test for i don't know sort of the, the the project that ended up emerging the um the symbols the motifs the themes that that came up again and again in the photographs were ones that um that, that ended up forming the project so the the work in form of the project rather than having the project preconceived and and then going out and shooting the work and that's just the way this major sort of body of work on sydney came together um it sort of encompasses in everything i do so essentially i am the project it's a very personal kind of driven project um but i can see how other other projects um can come from an idea so you can have an idea and then you can go out and, and and realize the idea and there's photographers that even put together um immense amount of research before they go and um go out and shoot the idea they might do a year's worth of research they might consult google maps they might have a shot list they might have places in mind they might have a, a travel guide or a fixer at the location they're going to um, and the actual shooting of the project might take a week and so that year's worth of research ends up um informing the concept and then they might spend a year or two editing the project and um it's just it's just about finding what what works for you and what you want to say your your photos um might speak to you in ways that you don't yet realize and that project might come from looking at the work that you've done and putting it together and noticing those patterns like it did for me or it might be might come from an idea or a desire or a concept to to realize something um so yeah for me it came quite um, naturally from the photographs, but for others, I guess it comes from um, sort of coming up with the idea and then going and shooting it. Yeah. And I've got another question here as well. So thanks for that from Mark Davidson. It's a fairly long one, but we'll get there. Mark first says he loves your work and he's enjoying watching your, seeing your progression over the decade as you've been making photos. But his questions are, have you ever felt frustrated with photography and your progression during that period of experimentation? And did you ever feel your work wasn't good enough? And if so, how did you respond to those feelings? Yeah, no, it's another good question. Thanks, Mark, for the question and the compliments. Um, yeah, I still feel that now. So it's not something that ever goes away. Um, I still feel dis dissatisfied with my work. I still feel it's never good enough. I'm my own harshest critic a lot of the time. Um, that's why I put... I don't put that much work out there. If you look at sort of what I've got on Instagram at the moment, I'm always putting stuff up and then taking it down because I'm so critical about it. Um, so there is that frustration and there is that um, feeling that um, it's never good enough. But I, I try to use that as a motivator to go out and make something better and figure out why it's not working and figure out what I need to do differently in order to, to get the photograph that I want. Um, there's a lot of people i think who feel satisfied with the work that they do and that's 
that's fine. It's fulfilling something in their life that they they need. But for me, it's um, I guess that I that I want to go out and and uh, do better each time and and find something new, find something different, and um, yeah, I I've been revisiting the same locations for years and years, trying to make a better photograph each time. Um, so in that way, it's frustrating. In that way, it's um, an ongoing kind of struggle. But also. I guess you also have to be a bit of an optimist if you are going through that. So for me, it's um, that I'm hopeful and that I um, think I can get something better the next time that also brings me out. So I think you also have to have that mindset of optimism that that um, the next best shot is around the corner and um, the, ne the next breakthrough will happen if you just keep pushing, and keep working. Um, often there's a gap between our taste in photography and our actual ability and a lot of the a lot of the the work that needs to be done is is just bridging that gap so you know what a great photograph is you know what photographs appeal to you you know you look at a gary winogrand photograph or a trent park or an Arel audio or joel meyerwitz photograph and you go wow that's a great photograph that really speaks to me that that grabs my attention and gives me the gut punch that 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 i'm really that's why i'm into photography but your work might not be there yet, and for most of us, it's not, and that's okay. Your taste and your actual photographs and your actual ability, the, the job of you is to bridge the gap between the two and um, realising that and not being um, critical and frustrated um, is, is, is hard. Um, so it's a battle, and, and I think you have to stay optimistic. <laughs> Sorry, it's a very long-winded answer. <laughs> no, it was a... Great question by Mark, and it was a great response too. So thanks for that, Sam. So um, th that's it at the moment. That's all the questions I've got from the audience. All right, I'll let flick, you sh share us again. Yeah, yeah. Flick back to the screen. Um, yeah, this one, 2014 Melbourne Cup. Um, we do celebrate Melbourne Cup in Sydney. There's always a TAB set up at Martin Place. Um, I think it was the year where there was a bit of tragedy in the race. So the horse, I think a couple of horses had falls and um, had to be euthanised afterwards maybe. Um, but, yeah, this lady sort of had crept away from the crowd and was having a quiet smoke and the little balloon floating behind her was sort of the, the thing that drew me to the photo. Um, and I got there in time to sort of frame it and, and get her as she's reaching for maybe her lighter in her bag there. So I thought, yeah, it's beauty. There's beauty, but there's also maybe sadness there. Um, it's a fairly recent one. This is one of those spots where I'd go back to year after year and never get the right shot. Um, this sign would blow up in the light at certain times of the year and just look spectacular, but I'd never be able to sort of fill the frame around it. Uh, there's a fruit stand on the left-hand side that makes things difficult in shooting in that spot sometimes because um, you're very conspicuous and there's not much space between you and the people crossing the road. Um, but this time I managed to get something. Circular key again. Um, older people. I know it's a bit of a fish in the barrel sort of thing and, and again, it's sort of a street photography cliche, but I really like the sense of the character and, and sort of the being a battler and surviving and and uh these two these two figures sort of go together for me because they're both sort of battlers and i've seen them around sydney for years and years and this lady here um i even saw her a couple of weeks ago so she's still um every day going to the shops with her stroller and walking up this hill and, and battling away and um it's yeah that that sort of um sadness but also the kind of um stoicism and beauty in the struggle as well sort of spoke to me a lot in those two um that's a fairly recent one when we're in lockdown the crowds are gone from circular key they took the time i think at the opera house to do repairs so you have these hoardings around the sides of the opera house the same color as the opera house sort of uh, stone to try and blend in but I noticed that the joggers going past their shadows would cast up big on the wall so night after night I'd go there and sort of take the same photograph of the shadow on the wall but nothing else was filling the flame until um, this couple came along and it was a really windy day and 
they're struggling to take their kind of photo together and they manage to do it and then they're walking away and get belted by the wind and I just happen to be at the right spot I knew where to be to sort of position myself to try and get the shot and I was lucky that a bunch of joggers had gone past and this guy was the last one of the group and everything sort of came together in the moment. Um, another earlier kind of one, uh, you can see that that's, that's a 50 millimetre one because the space is quite compressed there. Really like this wall, this golden coloured wall. Um, really like the one eye poking out and the, the red socks in the background as well. This one's another kind of homage or I guess a bit of a blatant ripoff um, of one of Trent Park's famous photos, his summer rain photo of a um, guy waiting at the lights with the tie over his shoulder. I think it's the front cover on some editions of the Dream Life book. Um, but we had this crazy storm on Anzac Day one year and um, my wife was pregnant at the time with our first child and she was about eight days overdue so we went on this big walk uh, from Newtown to Sydney Park um, to try and get things moving I was already sort of having time off work to try and be there and and um, yeah things were overdue so we went on this big walk and um, we saw this huge storm coming across from the hills like when we we're at Sydney Park we could see the storm coming across so we started walking back down King Street and uh, it started hailing and the hail was the size of Sort of pebbles and some of the stones were even like little golf balls and um it created almost like a layer of what looked like snow on the ground so we had this tremendous storm and we're both hiding there and then the light started to come out and i sort of looked at her and she looked at me and she sort of gave me a nod and said all right go on so i left my poor <laughs> nine months pregnant overdue wife on the corner so I could go quickly snap some photos in the light while the rain was still belting down and the hail was still there and um, we only had maybe 10 minutes of light but it was just the most amazing sight that I've ever seen um, while photographing and of course um, that that Trent Park photo came to mind and this is almost like a recreation of it looking over the shoulder looking out to the other side of the road so um, in some ways it's a bit of a ripoff, but I've always liked the photo because it has that memory attached to it and um, Yeah, speaks to me speaks to me in that way um, That's a fairly recent one. I don't think I've shown anyone that one. That's just Market Street at the end of the day light coming straight down for that February time of year um, Really golden light uh, it's another one of those panoramic type shots, manly, ferry, people disembarking. That was in the little book that I did. And circular key. It's one of the tourists were, were still here. You had people taking in a smoke break, work at the opera house there in the foreground. People taking a photo in front. There's all little stories around the frame of this one. I really quite like it as a as a photograph because there's different little groups of people each layer and each one has a little story in it um, and then the thing that sort of makes it is the bird flying through at the right time little startled pigeon um, in amongst all this kind of stillness it's that golden wall again this one's on the ferry on the manly ferry one day when we were going on a bit of a day trip shooting through the windows had the inside and the outside of the ferry simultaneously it's a fairly recent one that one's in newtown where i live really like the tattoo and the crutch leading on the crutch but then the the sort of t-shirt with the wolf on it in the background as well as what made it for me it's almost like in amongst all this kind of beauty and fragility there's this angry kind of face of the wolf ready to strike it's down at Circular Key again, really golden light. Last light of the day. It's the Manly Ferry approaching, that's fairly recent. Bit of a spider there. I think that was taken in lockdown. There weren't any people around, so I found something to shoot. Um, 
and and once the light goes i still try and make a few photographs every now and again this one using like the street lamps from a construction site and sort of using the natural light in the background with that pink glow still on the horizon uh, with the very harsh sort of artificial light of a street lamp sort of highlighting the sky uh, it's car headlights hitting her so this is on halloween there's actually two people there but you probably can't see the guy uh, he's dressed up as the devil and she's dressed up as the angel and there's a car head there's car headlights coming and hitting her and lighting her up just the back streets of newtown um yeah that's that's kind of it for uh that project that sydney project that invisible light that's um 10 years worth of photos 10 years worth of uh developing as a photographer um i guess that's uh that's where i'm at at the moment at the moment i'm still editing i'm still going through work that i haven't yet looked at so that's why there was a few photos in there that i haven't shown anyone before um and i'm hopefully going to do something with it one day i'm just not sure yet so still still working and still putting it all together awesome sam that's so awesome i've got a couple more questions here um in fact a few coming up now um from mark adams have you found that your focus has shifted in more recent times with less foot traffic around the city um yeah definitely um i still have that need to um to make photos it's still sort of part of who i am and and if i don't have photography then i don't know what i'm going to do with myself so um even in these times when we're kind of locked down i'm still going on walks with my camera or going for exercise with my camera so um the focus has shifted away from people and trying to get close to people um in maybe maybe looking at other things maybe looking at um the space, the emptiness of it, um, how things have changed, um, the emotion of this time, this sort of really strange time that we're in and how that can be conveyed photographically. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, the focus may be shifted definitely in, in recent times, but I still put a few of those um, recent photos in the, in the presentation because I think they just go with that body of work um even though you don't have the crowded sort of touristy scenes anymore there's still that quality of light and still that maybe focus on moment gesture color um the some of the symbols and motifs and, and that kind of thing absolutely i think that what connects a lot of your work is what you say light so that that still works you're just showing it in this time that light mm. Um, a question for here from Mike is, what's the worst experience you've had taking someone's picture on the street? Yeah, um, taking someone's picture, I haven't had many bad ones. Like I've had um, people who I didn't take their photo kind of react badly to me with a camera. Um, so that, that that would be kind of some of the worst experiences. Um, so, yeah, there's two that probably come to mind. Um there's one where I was shooting nearby where a city of Sydney sort of construction site was and one of the workers sort of was watching me for a while and then he decided to sort of, I don't know, confront me about what I was doing. He thought he'd caught me, sort of hero complex maybe, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, he started swearing and sort of going off and you calling me a creep and saying I was photographing all the young women and all this sort of thing. And I tried to show him my photos. I tried to talk him um, sort of down from yelling and screaming and ranting at me, but it just didn't work. So I just had to walk away from that situation. And I kind of learned from that one that if someone's really angry at you, you probably can't um, do anything about it in the moment. They're just going to continue being angry because they've already, um, already staked quite a big claim there they've already taken a big step so they're not going to really back down from that position because they sort of they're not going to listen to you they're not going to be reasonable so walking away i think from that situation sort of made me realize well if that ever happens in the future i definitely would just walk away rather than trying to sort of explain myself and justify myself the other one that i was thinking of happened really recently um first time that i've been sort of physically confronted on the street and uh, it was actually really weird because I wasn't 
photographing at the time. I just had a camera around my neck and I go everywhere with a camera around my neck. So I'd finished photographing at Newtown Station, um, was just texting my partner and she's giving me a shopping list and I'm just walking to the supermarket and then I sort of just got jumped on by some guy from behind. And, um, yeah, like he just whacked me from behind and, and then I turned around luckily very quickly and sort of put some space between him and I and he started screaming at me like, oh, you can't walk around with a camera and, like, he, he was not not all there. Mm. Um, I think he had quite a, quite a few issues, but um, it was really scary that uh, someone would react that way to a to a camera being around around your neck and he was sort of saying, well, I'm going to rip that off your neck and kind of take it because that's within my rights. You can't have a camera around your neck. And so, um, yeah, I had to sort of go into the supermarket and, and this guy was sort of waiting for me out the front and saying, if soon as you come out, I'm going to get you. So I had to call the cops and oh, wow. the cops turned up and sort of talked him and talked to him and sort of calmed him down. And then I was able to leave with my shopping. <laughs> wow. That, that, so one that, that, was, one. that was only maybe like a month ago. So that was really um, full on, but that's probably the, the most full on that thing that's ever happened to me on the street 99% of the time it's absolutely fine and um i've had many conversations with curious people many people wondering what i'm doing or or um wanting to sort of question what i'm doing and i'm always happy to talk and always i'm always um kind of able to to have a conversation or show people my instagram or or um explain what i'm doing but this guy i think was just um, suffering suffering in some way and just sort of um, saw the camera and then uh, reacted very badly to it. So it wasn't it wasn't because of street photography. It was just because I was in the wrong time. Wrong. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yep. Um, Mike Reed, he, he um, he's asking you how much post processing and with what program do you use? Yeah, so I try and I, like because it's color photography, I try and keep it quite minimal. Um, so I get the Adobe suites um, through my school, so I can use those ones. So I'd use um, Photoshop, which um, sort of seems the best way to kind of um, process images for me to, to turn the digital negative into a JPEG if I need to do that um, or to do like the color correction on them. So usually my process is to click the auto, auto contrast button and then, um, then to, to save it as a JPEG. <laughs> so it's very minimal post-processing. Recently, I've started using Lightroom as well, though, so I'm still getting the hang of that. And um, mainly I've used that for cataloging. So it's been really useful for cataloging photos um, rather than doing too much to them in, in post-production. Awesome. Just a couple more. One from me is, um, are you tempted to explore black and white again? And I also notice everything you shoot is landscape in orientation. You don't sort of look yeah. at portrait. Yeah, it's true. I, yeah, um, yeah. Well, first of all, the the landscape thing. I think I've done that for a while now. Um, where, um, yeah, I haven't really experimented with the with the portrait view for a while. So early on, I was experimenting with both kind of setups. But I just found the landscape. I could I could fill the frame in the way I I wanted to, um, and just work on the edges of the frame and having the the action. Um, spread out across the frame in, in that way and it's almost like seeing seeing the world in a cinematic kind of way for me um, yep. I noticed that the photographers that I was drawn to also a lot of their work is shot that way so I look at Alex Webb's work and um, Costa Manos's work and Harry Grier's work a lot of that's in in or most of that's in the landscape kind of point of view and I think it's that cinematic quality of those color photographs that I'm drawn to so yeah, I mean, if the situation called for it, I have um, done the portrait um, orientation shot. I just haven't got anything really good from it, um, maybe because I don't practice or, or do it enough. Um, in terms of black and white, um, I recently had a bit of a trial of the, the Leica Q2 monochrome, and uh, I've got a bit of a body of work there that I shot over three weeks, so a little series of black and white photos of sydney so i'll release that sometime soon i think i still have to talk to Leica about when we're going to put those out but um yeah those, those will hopefully come soon so i did have a bit of a play in black and white and that was really interesting so 
I jumped straight in. I only shot black and white for those three weeks. Um, I took about 4,000 photos. Um, so I was out there every day trying to shoot everything I could, uh, shooting out the bus window to and from school. Um, and eventually by the end I was seeing the world, I guess, a little bit in black and white and, and knew it and, and had that sort of knowledge of um, or sort of that, I guess, ability to preempt the scene or pre-visualise the scene in, in black and white um, because I was getting used to it. Um, and then it was really weird to jump back into colour. So colour, it was super weird. Once I started shooting colour again, uh, everything seemed really oversaturated and really gaudy and... and uh, over the top so um yeah i don't know if i'm the sort of person who could shoot both comfortably i think i'd have to stick to one or another um yeah. over a long period of time to really get used to it and get the most out of it and um last one sam of your time last question and then mark adams again from him um and he actually says last question what's next <laughs> for sam ferris and i think this is the you know, perfect one to end up on Oh yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, for me personally, I'm I'm still shooting. Um, hopefully, we get out of lockdown soon and we get back to kind of normality. Um, so I'll be back doing the the same things that I've always been kind of doing and um, trying to trying to work on those projects, get that book together. Um, hopefully, put something out soon. Um, also got Aussie Street, which is the, the group I'm sort of part of. Um, we ran a festival a couple of times uh, in 2018 and 2019. Uh, it was a really good event. So we had a couple of international guests like Matt Stewart and my friend uh, Jorge Garcia from the New York Street Photography Collective came out. Um, it was a really good time. So it was unfortunate that we couldn't run that in again in 2020. Um, but we're hopefully going to do that again one day soon. So um, you can follow that on Instagram if you like. It's it's Aussie Street, um, and hopefully it's going to get up and running. So yeah, those those two things, my own work and uh, family and school and Aussie Street, will keep me very busy. So I've got lots to do. Awesome. <laughs> and just one last comment I've got here from Hugh over in the UK. He just says, "Sam, terrific presentation. Get your book out!" Exclamation mark. <laughs> exclamation mark. And he says, "Where's my prints?" I'm not sure if he's got something ordered from you or not. Yeah, but... no, I've got a, I've got a couple of prints for you. I, I said I'd send them with the book um, as a gift because he's one of my sort of great supporters. He's a really nice guy, Hugh. So um, I do have his prints for him as a thank you for being such a great supporter. And um, and uh, yeah, I'll send those eventually one day when I've got the book. <laughs> so I'll hand back over to Russell now. Um, thank you very much for your time, there, Sam. No, no problem. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks very much, Sam, and, and uh, thanks for handing over, Adrian. Uh, what a brilliant presentation. Uh, fantastic images, and it was a really great presentation on your evolution as well, which I thought was a really great insight to your progression through street over the last 10 or so years so, and uh, how, how you go about your craft. So congratulations. Um, I actually have a few questions too. But I have about a million questions for you, but I, I'll make it really quick. But I, I just notice you, you get really close to your subjects now. They're really identifiable. Do you have anyone, it's kind of like an extension of the question about, you know, has anyone hassled you, but do you have anyone come up after you've shot, like, and see their own image in the pre, in in a, in a, a gallery or something like that or online or whatever? And and, and what's, what, what's, what is their reaction? Yeah, um, I've only had one person ever contact me about being in a photograph, and that was... Um, an exhibition we did a couple of years ago as part of the Head On Festival, which was called City to Surf, which was sort of a mix of uh, city street photographs and, and beach street photographs. Um, and that photograph that I put in that exhibition, I think it was published um, on the Head On website and someone had seen it and then they, they noticed it was their housemate that was in the photograph, this guy sort of carrying a surfboard in the middle of the city um so he he contacted me and, and said hey like that's me in the photo <laughs> and i sort of wrote him i wrote an, wrote him an email back and said yeah that, like cool like um would you like a print <laughs> and he he said no he, he's all right but he just thought it was really um really weird that he was sort of out there in a in a sort of an exhibition um so most people most people are fine most people are pretty cool and um 
Uh, yeah, like a lot of the people are identifiable. So if anyone ever has like a major issue with anything I that I do, I'm, I mean, I'm more than happy to talk to them and even delete photos or take them down if there's some sort of um, issue, like they're a person who maybe is escaping domestic abuse or something like that and, and they don't want their face out there. Um, I'm always, yeah, I'm very happy to sort of take photos down for the right reason. So um, I've never had sort of confrontation in the moment around that issue, but I've only ever had that one person contact me afterwards. I just, I just think that looking at your work, like I think you're a great ambassador for street, and looking at your work, I don't think anyone will get upset about what you're, what you're doing or how you go about your craft. So it was interesting just to see what the, if there was any feedback for from that from my. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Russell. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's what it is. Like it, it's how you present yourself on the street, and and the vibe that you give off is just as important as the type of images that you're making. And if you know in your heart that what you're doing is is. Um, is okay and that you're comfortable with it and and uh that you're not doing anyone any harm or not intending anyone any harm people pick up on that and um yeah that that tends to come across in when i'm on the street and and when i'm taking photos that the most i'll ever get is a smile or a nod or kind of a maybe a question like oh did what are you doing do you take my photo <laughs> and then you then you have a chat it's, it's good you can explain and then you might even get an, an instagram follower out of it or something <laughs> yeah awesome and there's just one other thing that the david gibson book um a hundred straight uh hundred great street photograph, uh, photographs um i know I, I love that book and i think it's a great introduction for anyone into street because it's such a varied um range of images and that and then there's your image here which i absolutely love yeah. <laughs> a couple of things. A couple of things I want to say. One is, are they bin chickens? Because if so, it's like the quintessential Sydney photo. Yep, it sure. They sure okay. are. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The other one is, how did how did you go about actually getting the book? Uh, sorry, getting the photo into the book. What was the process behind that? Um, I think David saw it on Flickr and he contacted me. So um, yeah, I think he was putting together the book and uh, it was a project that he was working on for some time. But I I obviously didn't know about it um i think only sort of the inner circle of kind of the in public guys were aware of what he was doing and then um he reached out one day to me on Flickr and said i really like this photo like could i include it in the book and i said yep sure <laughs> i was very very flattered to sort of see that he he rated it as a street photo and um wanted to include it in a publication with sort of a lot of my heroes and and idols Absolutely. No, congratulations on that. I just think it's it just it's just another example of what you can do out on the street. I think those hundred photographs just a great portfolio with the, the variety and the diversity of street photography. So I love it. Um yeah. Um the only other thing I was gonna say is I have my zine here. When are your first one? The off key zine. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah, I you got the black too. one. That's the good one. Yeah, well that, that was the first one actually. I think yeah. there's some photos in there, so it must have been one of the very first ones with the limited Oh, there you go. But um, yeah, I just congratulate you <laughs> on the quality of that too. And oh, is cool. there anything? Yeah, no, it's just we were having as we were having a look at um, producing a zine around the same time as that came out. And I, th I looked at that and I thought, wow, that's 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 a really nice um, quality um, piece of work there compared to what else is out there um, as well. I'd like to congratulate you on that. But uh, just finally, is there anything else in the pipeline um, heading down that track? Yeah, I th well. Um... I might be putting out a little book soon. It, yeah, I mean, I think I've told this story before, so people have probably heard it. But um, like I was going to publish the Invisible Invisible Light book and I was at the final stage of sort of sending that off to be printed and I showed it to a few friends and um, it just wasn't, it just wasn't there um, in terms of the quality of the production and maybe in terms of the, the amount of photos in the book as well. It was a very small edit of the work um it was probably 35 photos um in a sort of eight by ten format so it was quite a small book and i just had it next to my other books on the shelf and i just thought it doesn't really look like a photo book it looks like a something in between a zine and a book and then i showed it to a few friends and they said well if you're going to do it do it right like it's your one your one chance to publish this project that you spent sort of 10 years shooting you you probably should make it as good as it can be um so i'm going to hold on to that work for a while and and um see what happens with it but i might put out something else in the near future i've been editing a lot in the last couple of weeks in lockdown so um i thought i had a really good 
2020 kind of pandemic kind of series looks like that's kind of ongoing now so I might have to pivot to something else and i've got a bit of a series on on berlin actually not sydney so um some photographs that i took in berlin over sort of the periods that i've stayed there because my partner is from berlin and her family still lives there so um we'd often go there and stay with her family um her brother um is quite severely disabled and her parents sort of care for him and um i always see in my in my partner sort of that uh, that she's torn between berlin and sydney and um then there there i am sort of the person who took her away and um sort of feeling out of place in that setting not speaking the language and not really able to connect and um the photos and the story is sort of about that experience and and being in that place and and being in the outsider and um they're very different kind of photos not so much focused on the light but more sort of um the using a flash and, and using it to create various textures and kind of uh, complicated kind of images that that maybe have that psychological depth to them but yeah um it could be could be coming soon <laughs> all right well, i haven't been on social media much in the last couple of years for, for a number of reasons but um i'll have to uh i'll have to keep an eye out see what you're doing but, so, but um i'd just like to congratulate you on the body of work that you got so far and uh and I guess thank you very much um, for, uh, for presenting this tonight. So um, on behalf of the ASPE members, I'd like to thank you for your, for your time. Thank you very much. No, thank you, guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks to Adrian for organising. Thank you, Russell, for hosting. Thanks, everyone at ASPE. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Okay. So if anyone would like to view more of Sam's work, you can go to www.sandferris.com where you can check out a list of uh, exhibitions, publications, awards, and of course, more of his works. Uh, there's projects there you can have a look at. It's fantastic stuff. Uh, you can also check out his Instagram feed at Ferris Whiskey. Um, have I missed anything there, Sam? No, that's it. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again for your presentation. Uh, please remember to subscribe to the Aspie YouTube channel if you have not already. And if, uh, if you do so, you will not miss out on any future content. Also, check out our Insta feed for members' content, news, and the monthly cha challenges. Uh, this series will continue next month. As usual, it will be on the uh, second Tuesday of the month. So our special guest speaker will be the very talented Mark Forbes. So that's 8 p.m. Tuesday, the 10th of August. So you can put that one in your diaries. And just a quick note for those people who are exhibiting in Sithom, uh, you should have submitted your image details by now. So hanging day is the next thing on the calendar, and that is Wednesday, the 28th of July. Uh, there'll be an email sent out about a few bits and pieces regarding that. And after that, we had the opening night on Friday, the 30th of July, where we are purposely holding back some details on that due to the ever-changing COVID compliance rules, etc. But uh, all we can say is that it will be on the 30th and it'll be from 7 p.m. to 8.30. So Team Aspie will send out a detailed email once we get closer to the date. And finally, if you have any questions regarding membership, sit home or anything else, Aspie, please contact us via our contact page at aspie.com.au. So thank you for joining us tonight and we hope to see you.